Greetings fellow readers, this is Rambling Collector here, and we are finally back with another book review for all of you today. And for this one, we're going to be diving back into the world of Warhammer 40,000 with an omnibus that I have been really itching to try out for a while. We're going to be talking about the ever so famous Night Lord's Omnibus by Aaron Dembski Bowden. I will admit, I heard a lot of great things about this omnibus before picking it up, yet when I finally did and got the chance to read it back in December, and just now finished it this month, I can definitely say it was worth the journey. At a whopping 942 pages, it better well be. But, with that being said, let's get started on the overall thoughts about it. So firstly, I will say the Night Lords one, so I've read Chaos Marine books in the past, those being the Fabius Bile trilogy, and as well as the Black Legion books. For those of you who haven't yet seen those reviews, I'll leave a link to them up here for the cards. You'll be able to see them right now. But the Night Lords one is one that I had heard a great deal about. And one thing I will say is that this particular omnibus, it provides a unique and interesting perspective upon a traitor legion that does not strictly follow chaos, yet mingles very often with the various major players within the Chaos Marine faction. And to explain that, the Night Lords themselves are a traitor legion, yet they do not follow any of the major powers of Chaos, like the Emperor's Children, the Death Guard, World Leaders, or even Thousand Sons do. They are strictly against Chaos, yet they also do Chaos Undivided in some aspects. Yet, throughout the entire series, we see them mingling with two of the major players when it comes to Chaos Marines, those being the Black Legion in Book 1, and the Red Corsairs in Book 2. Both of which end in a bit of disaster, not even gonna lie. I will say they do a lot better with the Red Corsairs compared to the Black Legion, but even then, they just cannot catch a break. But one thing that I will definitely say is another highlight of this whole omnibus is that this provides a tight group of characters that we follow throughout the series, keeping the cast small to allow for greater character development and connection to the story. Now, our main characters throughout this entire story are the group known as First Claw, consisting of Talos, Uzas, Syrian, Zarl, and Mercutian. Later on, we are also joined by other characters such as the twin slaves that serve Talos, them being Septimus and the navigator Octavia. Septimus at, acting as his armorer, Octavia as the navigator for their ship, the Covenant of Blood. Now, we are joined later on by another character known as Varial, former Red Corsair's Marine, also known as Varial the Flayer. But one thing I will say is that it keeps the cast strictly to first claw. It only introduces other characters throughout in little tidbits here and there, such as other companies or random one-off Marines who are just there and then gone, or even just minor supporting characters like Septimus Octavia and later on Lucorophus, the leader of the Bleeding Eyes group within the 10th company that we follow. But First Claw, I will say, had a wide variety of crazy characters, from Talos being the semi-honorable warrior who wants to see his legion be better, yet also has a very deep bitterness to it. Meanwhile, we have Uzas, the snarling berserker at times. More often than not, though, he's just very, very confused, but I will say his story definitely has a huge tragedy towards the end. But then you also have Zarl, the proud warrior who is the best fighter amongst First Claw. Mercutian, who has a very philosophical look to him, I would say. Considering that at one point, when it cuts to all First Claw assembling, we have Mercutian writing down in a scroll, of all things. Just standing away, writing down the Legion's stories, which I thought was kind of wholesome. Kind of funny, really, when you think about it. And then Syrian who has a bit of a fierce sense. Syrian and Zarl apparently were like best friends to Talos, having a very close connection towards each other. We're even introduced to a dreadnought known as Malkarian throughout, who was seen as a hero of the Night Lord's Legion. But I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. But more than that, one thing I will say about the Chaos Marine books is that throughout it, we get glimpses of the Primarchs, after the Horus Heresy. Like, I know the Horus Heresy series, apparently, is the big spotlight for all the Primarchs, both Loyalist and Traitor. 
But I like the Cast Marine books because we get to see the other traitor Primarchs after the heresy is done. For instance, in the Black Legion books, we see a clone of Horus get confronted by and killed by his former first captain, Ezekiel Abaddon, the leader of the Black Legion. Then in the Fabius Bile books, we see Fabius Bile meeting his now demonic Primarch, Fulgrim, I believe in book three. And throughout Night Lords, it's the same thing. Because while Comrade Kurz is currently dead in the setting, it's his actions and his behavior towards his own sons that reflects on them even now. Because let's be honest here, Conrad did not have the greatest relationship with his legion. There were very few of his sons that he liked, considering that the Night Lords were a massive legion of gang members, criminals, murderers, all that kind of stuff, which Conrad Kurz did not exactly agree with. Then again, considering his home planet was a hive of scum and criminal activity, I can't really fault him on that. But then again, it is sort of his fault from pulling from his own home world if he knows it's got bad blood in there. But regardless, though, Conrad was afflicted with visions of the future, which absolutely drove him insane. But one thing that this trilogy provides is the chance to see Talos interacting with Conrad Kurz during his final days, when Conrad knew that an assassin was coming for his head, and he was calling Talos, his moniker, the Soul Hunter. With the main joke of this title being that Talos would disobey the final orders of his Primarch and hunt this one soul above all others, the one that killed his gene father. Which, in all honesty, that's kind of pretty warped. Not gonna lie, though, the Soul Hunter title is very cool. But we also see his final days on Sigwalsa, as well as the immediate fallout of his assassination, where the Ultramarines came in packing a lot of firepower and absolutely scattered the Night Lords. And this was after Conrad Kurz's assassination. But another big highlight of this one is that this provides an insight into Night Lord culture, both their language and way of life. Like, if you're gonna grow up on a planet that is riddled with crimes of minor to severe, you're going to have to learn to survive and learn how to fight dirty overall. Nothing is out of the cards for them. While some might have a more honorable stance, considering their position as warriors and such, a lot of them are more scumbags who are out, at, out to serve themselves or survive the Legion in some way, shape, or form, but they are not above flaying their enemies, tossing them into flesh pits and things like that. There's even something that I'm going to talk about later on when it comes to talking about the third book of the series. But one of the biggest things that I really enjoyed was their introduction of another language. The Night Lords apparently have a unique language all their own, known as Nostraman, and they use this to communicate amongst themselves as well as with their slaves. And how we learn this is through Octavia, the newly acquired slave that we see in book one, and her interactions of hearing everyone else on the ship speaking in a different language from her, because the normal imperial language is Gothic. Not English, Gothic. And for her to have to interact with and learn the various different nuances and ways of writing and speaking another language, that was actually pretty interesting. I'm not even going to lie to you there. And a lot of times, when I think about it now, what looks like English to us could be the Night Lords speaking in Nostraman towards each other. And honestly, I thought that was pretty cool. A very unique detail to make them look even more like outsiders, speaking their own language away from the rest of the universe. I thought that was pretty cool. But if you want to skip to the conclusion, I will leave a tag that leads to the end of it. Because from here on out, I want to talk about the three main books themselves. This over here was just a highlight of the entire omnibus, but I want to go a little bit into detail about each major book within this omnibus. With that being said, let's get started. So first up, we have the first book of the series, Soul Hunter, where we are first introduced to First Claw, as well as their current situation. And I will say... This one was definitely a very interesting one. It had a lot of great fight scenes with it, especially since the Night Lords here, who are under the command of the possessed Night Lord or captain known as the Exalted, or also known as Vandrid, whom Talos had sworn an oath of servitude to. 
despite the fact that he hates what his captain has become, this mutated demonic hybrid of flesh and demonic taint. And yet we see the Night Lords, specifically 10th Company, teaming up with the Black Legion to assault the forge world of Kreeth. We see how they attack Agapino world, that being in a prison world where you work until your dying days. They liberate the folks there to bolster their forces before marching onward towards Kreeth, which is a massive forge world controlled by the Adeptus Mechanicus. And let me tell you guys something. Assaulting a forge world is never a good idea, especially if you know you are possibly going to be outgunned, considering that the Adeptus Mechanicus can create a massive army of cyborgs or even just giant walkers that can obliterate armies within seconds. You better come in there well armed and ready for a massive slugfest of firepower. But throughout all of this, we see Talos first seeing a scrap of his homeworld in the Stramo still left, where he picks up a few servitors, as well as Octavia, the navigator. And how they find out about this is from a vision that Talos endures, because like his gene father, Conrad Kurz, Talos throughout the entire series is afflicted with visions of the future. However, unlike Conrad, who is able to withstand them, Talos is not. For whatever reason, his body is not compatible. And every time he has a vision, it leads to him nearly dying, suffering seizure, or spouting out the words as he is seizing on the ground, bleeding from his eyes and ears, ears and just absolutely wasting away in those few moments. And he could be out for hours or even days, depending on how severe the, I want to say, vision is. It's a really rough experience. And I got to tell you, reading his time under those visions as he's spouting away these words while in agonizing pain, that was pretty rough to read. I'm not going to lie. But throughout all of this, we see how the Black Legion also operates as well. And I want to say that this actually takes place after the Black Legion books, because by then the full Legion is assembled, they're committing their attacks, and this is right before the 13th Black Crusade, one of the most well-known events in Warhammer 40k lore. But I will say, watching Talos interacting with the Black Legion, seeing how all of them are just following chaos, worshipping it to the highest of degrees, and then meeting Abaddon, who is a literal avatar for chaos at this rate, despite his claims of how he only uses it as a tool, I gotta say, it was pretty interesting. But also, Abaddon's actions of just blasting Talos in the face when Talos decides to talk back to him or reject his offer of servitude, only to then get confronted with the four chaos gods of Korn, Zinj, Nurgle, and Selenesh each. I gotta say, that was a pretty interesting point to watch Talos look at all four of these gods stretched out before him, seeing all the visions and offers and promises that they could give him. And yet he was like, you know what? I'm not interested. Go away. I gotta say, that takes some severe willpower. And I was thoroughly impressed by that. But then, after seeing just how their legion is constantly getting disposed of as frontline cannon fodder, despite the fact that this is against everything the Night Lords are good at, which is stealth, assassination, and sabotage, I can understand why 10th Company at that point would break away from the Black Legion, despite occurring massive amounts of damage, especially when the blood when the blood angels came a knocking and pretty much forced the entire Black Legion to retreat, whilst also invading even the Night Lords' ship, the Covenant of Blood, at the same time, and incurring a lot of casualties, both in soldiers, civilians, and just I wanna say property damage, to put it that way. So Soul Hunter, I will say, was a very strong introduction to the Night Lords. We see a bit of their culture, we learn about their Nostraman language, we see them fighting on the front lines in a war that they know they should probably have no part in, yet they feel as though they have no choice. Or at the very least, they have no choice in regards to their commander wanting to support the War Master. And yet we see how eventually even the Exalted is like, you know what, I don't like seeing my troops getting put aside like Swiss cheese or meat to a grinder, so goodbye. Have a nice day. And from that, I will say again, there's not really much I can say because it's been a while since I read through that book, but I will say the next two that I'm going to talk about are very still fresh in my mind with a few more details that I want to talk about 
So let's move on from Soul Hunter to the next one. Next up, we have Blood Reaver. This takes place after the Night Lords broke away from the Black Legion after incurring their casualties with the Blood Angels and everything else. We open up with them assaulting a, I want to say sort of abandoned, but more or less forgotten station. Where the Night Lords raid this entire station with no glory or anything else, but they plunder it for all the raw resources that they are going to need to repair their ship and resupply the troops. Because that's a whole key element here throughout the entire trilogy, is that the Night Lords are just struggling to survive on the fringes of the galaxy. They don't exactly have a lot of resources they can use, like, for instance, the Black Legion or the Red Corsairs. They are limited in what they can do, and as such, they are always just on the verge of collapse like hell. Talos and a lot of First Claw actually have to scavenge armor bits off of fallen marines just to reassemble it. Like, I like how Talos, at one point when he's being assaulted in Book 1 by the four Chaos Gods, we actually see all the scrapped together bits of armor that he has put his whole suit together with. And it's kind of humbling to see just how much they have to scavenge just to be able to survive and continue their long war of vengeance against the Imperium for the murder of their father and essentially the exile of their entire legion. But throughout all of this, we see how the Covenant of Blood barely escapes from getting assaulted again, or at least chased off. And then they proceed to head towards the Maelstrom, the whole... the home turf, I would say, of the Red Corsairs, the second major Chaos faction that we see here, or I should say Chaos Marine faction. And I will say, it definitely goes a lot better for them than it did with the Black Legion, because with the Red Corsairs, they agree to repair the Covenant of Blood in exchange for the raw materials there, as well as, let's see here, what's the word, restock the Night Lords? If... Tenth Company, or First Claw, helps to break down a fortress that the Red Corsairs wants to plunder and attack. That being a Astartes homeworld, or chapter world, of the Marines Errand. And these guys are actually a recurring villain throughout the first two, or I should say, not really villain, but opponent for the Night Lords throughout the first two books. Because we see the Night Lords constantly looking for supplies and stuff, and encountering the Marines errant throughout the first two books. And quite simply, the Night Lords, as well as the Red Corsairs, are responsible for what is essentially the eradication of an entire Space Marine chapter, which is about 1,000 troops for the Imperium that has just been lost. <laughs> which, considering the galaxy in the current state of it, is a pretty heavy loss, all things considered. But I do like how, unlike Abaddon, who puts the Night Lords on the front lines, for instance, as frontline troops or as meat for the grinder. Huron Blackheart, the leader of the Red Corsairs, he understands that the Night Lords do not work that way. And he has them go about and do what they are best at to help break and weaken the defenses around the chapter stronghold and allow make it a lot easier for the Red Corsairs to deploy their troops without any of the major defenses or power grids online. And that is one reason why I can respect Huron Blackheart a little better than I can Abaddon. Because while Abaddon has a really cool story of him wanting to unite the legions in a course of revenge against the Imperium, Huron also has a similar goal, yet he knows how to play his pieces. He doesn't just throw them all against the board like Abaddon does. He plays more strategically. He plays to the legions' strengths and what they are best at in exchange for them helping him out in a long-term goal that he might have. For instance, the acquiring of more gene seed to create more troops for his great army that he is building. And I really like that. I can actually respect that a lot. But regardless, though, one of the things that breaks the alliance with the Night Lords and the Red Corsairs is that they notice one of the ships within the Red Corsairs fleet is one of their own known as the Echo of Damnation, and they make it their goal to do the job for the Red Corsairs, but then afterwards betray them to acquire one of their long-lost capital ships. 
And whilst they do succeed in taking the ship, they wind up losing the Covenant of Blood when the Red Corsairs pursue them in an act of vengeance. And one of the things I will say here, this one was definitely a pretty good read as well, but I like how even Talos is acknowledging, or even any of the other members of First Call, they're acknowledging they don't enjoy this work. It feels pointless, boring even for them, because this doesn't really help them out as much as it does help out the Red Corsairs to accomplish their goal. It's not something the Night Lords themselves can be very proud of, I should say, at the very least. However, I do like how after this, I will say a the final book was a very great conclusion to this entire trilogy. And one of the things that this tri- series reminds you of is that the Night Lords, they are not good people. They will run away from a fight if they feel like they have no chance of winning or look for better odds. But when you consider their situation, it makes it a very tactical mood, I would say, or a very tactical reason, because they are out to survive when they are low on resources, numbers, and things like that. So they don't really have a choice except to employ this tactic, no matter how much it might grind against some of them. But I will say one of the biggest moments in here was watching the Exalted, or Vandrid, regain control of his body right as the Covenant of Blood is about to be blown up. And when he and Talos communicate for the final time, and Talos remarks remarks that Vandrid will be remembered, it's a really hard thing to hear when Vandrid goes, goes, for your sake, Talos, I really hope you don't. Like That was a really sad moment to see. I'm not even going to lie. Because this was somebody whom Talos and First Claw had at one point respected, reduced to a husk of a man possessed by a demon. But one thing I will say in the Exalted's favor, one major conversation that I see between them here, is how they talk about how they want to rebuild the Legion. Use all the gene stock that they have to try to reassemble the Night Lords and put them at full strength again. Because Talos, despite being a warrior, was at one point a battlefield medic for the Night Lords, or an apothecary. So seeing the Exalted and Talos having this sort of conversation, even though Talos is kind of on the brink of death here, after Uzas went on a blood rage, annihilated one of, their, one of the other troops of the Night Lords, and the other company came a-knocking for vengeance, with First Call just barely managing to beat them, Watching Talos, even in that moment of excruciating pain, communicating with the Exalted about the possibility of rebuilding the Night Lord's Legion, it was a pretty interesting conversation. I will say that much. But with that being said, let's move on to the final book of this trilogy. Void Stalker. The final book of this trilogy until Aaron Dembski Bowden either writes more, I don't know what the plan is there. But Void Stalker, oh man, where do I even begin with this one? So, throughout the entire our trilogy, as I mentioned before, Talos keeps on having these debilitating visions of the future, and it is rapidly killing him. However, it is very much confirmed through this novel that the gene seed that Talos was injected with is not compatible for his body. It might have taken years or centuries even for it to finally do this, but the gene seed within Talos is slowly killing him. Hence his body is debilitating over the course of Voidstalker in particular, because there are moments where he cannot remember ever giving orders, his memories are fading, and he cannot even tell the difference between a future vision or reality, or even a dream anymore. And that, honestly, is a horrifying prospect to think about. Like, think about that, for instance. Your body is debilitating over time. You are this superhuman soldier, and you are weakening. Imagining your body just breaking down to the point where you cannot remember hours or days ahead of time. You are unconscious or frantic, and it's a really hard thing to hear. For Talos especially, like he knew at some point he was possibly going to die, because Varial did confirm that. However, while it was confirmed that he wouldn't die, even if he did live on, he would be in excruciating pain. But, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Funny enough, the main plot point of Voidstalker is the Night Lords returning to the scene of where they had been scattered, Segwalsa, specifically 10th Company, returning to Segwalsa. And I will say, 
Watching them find out that their world, that they had left a barren wasteland, is finally inhabited by Imperial citizens. Watching them get all... What's the word I'm looking for here? Angry, or I should say vengeful, was kind of funny, but also overly interesting to see. Because to them, this was the enemy stepping upon their home turf, and they did not like it one bit. And I will say, I like how Voidstalker reminds you that the Night Lords are very much villainous by having them going around on Sigwalsa and slaughtering all the newly inhabited Imperial citizens. Like, I'm not kidding when I say this, they're going full slaughter fest. Just forcing these people down into underground shelters, leaving behind flesh pits to toss the bodies into. It's genuinely pretty horrifying. But this is the Night Lords at their peak, I will say, spreading terror far and wide across their former homeworld, and even managing to send a message to the Imperium as a result. Like, Talos actually has a very brilliant strategy, which is pretty dark, where he creates this sort of, I want to say, psychic backlash by using all the astropaths and using Octavia's third eye, which she possesses as a navigator, to force all these people who are experiencing unrelenting pain after being skinned alive to look into Octavia's eye, having their agony shot straight into the warp and creating what is essentially a wave of fear spreading from Seguelsa across the entire eastern fringe. And because of this, it sends a massive cry out to the Imperium of pain and misery, saying, hey, we're still here. We haven't disappeared like you think we are. We are still here, and we are going to continue spreading fear throughout the Imperium as we see fit. Only to have the response be not just from space marines coming back to avenge the fallen all and dead of the Imperial citizens, but the Eldar, whom apparently had had a future vision of a prophet of the Eighth Legion coming forward and causing massive amounts of damage to one of their craft worlds, Craftworld Uthwe, which is right in close proximity to the Eye of Terror. So they send a group of Eldar to deal with this, and watching the Night Lords making their last stand in the ruins of their abandoned fortress, which had been erected by Conrad Kurz and his legion, watching them make their final stand in the catacombs, almost facing off against the Eldar, that was incredible to witness. Like, they were going in there, no holds barred, expecting that they were about to die, but they went out gloriously. First Claw, as we watched them dying one by one, from Zarl fight, dying, fighting a, essentially a marine, space marine hero, in a one-on-one -on -one duel, that was... It was incredibly sad. I'm not even going to lie there. Like, watching him, him bleeding out from his injuries and then telling Talos that he agreed with his speech about how it's nice to have a cause to fight and die for, as Talos had said. And from then on, we just see all the other members of First Claw, excluding Varial, meeting their ends in one way or another. From all of them fighting one particular Eldar, or whom is known as a Void Stalker. Hence the name of the book, I should say. But then watching Talo, I was making this final fight with a broken blade, rent up armor, walking up to this Eldar, our champion, with nothing but a broken sword and a bunch of grenades, after saying, that alien killed my brothers, I'll kill her. That was pretty cool. And then seeing the epilogue, where we see Decimus, one of the newest Night Lord recruits, appearing. Watching how he pulls up of his helmet and says, I am Decimus, the prophet of the Eight Legion. And seeing him having this amalgamation of all of First Claw's armor, like having Talos's armor specifically, but also Zarl's bat wings grafted onto Talos's helm with tear lightning tear tracks like Syrians had, and even Uzas's fleet eight skin cloak combined with the freshly reforged blade that Talos had wielded throughout the trilogy. That was pretty cool. It's like he's the progeny of all of First Claw, wrapped into one figure. And I really, really want to see more of this series explored after this, because the way it ended, I will say it was pretty satisfying at the very least. Like, we knew these folks were not going to make it at some point or another. But watching how they went out was very 
entertaining and not to mention just engaging to read in. Like that is one thing I will always give Aaron Dembski Bowden is he is a fantastic writer when he really gets into it, especially when it comes to either combat or exploring characters. With that being said, though, let's move on to random thoughts. So overall, I know this video has gotten very long and I apologize for that, but moving into random thoughts here, I will say this one in particular really highlights why I like the Chaos Marine books and why I'm so eager to read more of them. Like I currently have the Word Bearers Omnibus, I have three more of the Audemon books to read and review at some point, and so many others like Lords of Silence, a Death Guard novel. And I know that there is plenty more out there for me to dive into, and I cannot wait to see more stories like this. And I know at some point I'm probably going to have to tackle the Horus Heresy, but I'm con going to continue putting that on the back burner until I've caught up with all the other novels and omnibuses that I've collected. But I will say this much. One of the things that really impacted me, I will say this much, was one particular quote that Talos says within Voidstalker, the third novel. When even though he is dying, even though he knows that the Legion will probably never change, he desperately wants it to. Like, that is a main thing that we see here. We see Talos' backstory throughout. How at one point, he was actually encouraged by his mother to try and be a hero. That is one thing that he had desperately wanted to be was a hero. But look where he ended up. Exiled on the fringes of the galaxy with a Legion that he has grown to despise for what they have become rather than what they possibly could be. And yet, one of the things that really sticks out to me is this quote here. Let me see if I can find it real fast. Ha. Here we are. When the other troops are preparing to deploy to Sequelsa, I will say, to put it here, and to quote here Talos, after Zaros asks if it is ever enough to just do what they do, how does Talos respond? And this is to quote here. It is not enough. We stand in the dust at the end of centuries of useless sin and endless failure. The Legion was poisoned, and we sacrificed an entire world to cleanse it. We failed. We are the sons of the only Primarch to hate his own Legion. There, again, we failed. We swore vengeance on the Imperium, yet we run from every battle where we don't possess overwhelming force over a crippled enemy. We fail, again and again and again. Have you ever fought a battle you'd struggle to win, with no hope of running away? Have any of us? Have you ever, since the Siege of Terra itself, drawn a weapon with the knowledge you might die? I will cast a shadow across this world. I will burn every man woman and child, so the smoke from the funeral pyres eclipses the sun. With the dust that remains, I will take the echo of damnation into the sacred skies above Terra and rain the ashes of twenty million mortals down onto the Emperor's palace. Then they will remember us. Then they will remember the legion they once feared. No more running. No more raiding to survive. When we see an Imperial world, we will no longer ask if it is worth attacking for plunder. We will ask how much harm its destruction would cause the Imperium. And when the War Master calls us for the 13th Crusade, we will answer him. Night by night, we will bring this Empire to its knees. I will cast aside what this Legion has become and remake it into what it should be. Do I make myself clear? End quote. That alone lets you know that Talos is very much frustrated and wants his Legion to do better, but he also hates what the Legion has done to him, as well as what it has become. Nothing but a band of pirates, murderers, and gangsters just trying to survive on the edge of the world, but he wants them to do better. I will say that quote alone really struck me when I read it, and it was so amazing to see that. And honestly, if you guys want a really good trilogy just for the heck of it, Night Lords is one that I do recommend. But more than that, again... One of the other things I love about the Chaos Marine books is how each of them are so very different from their ways of fighting to their philosophies to the various different characters within these legions that we have followed. 
like Ariman of the Thousand Suns, his story of trying to seek redemption. Fabius Bile, trying to unravel the secrets of the universe, or it's like the Dr. Frankenstein of Warhammer. And then, of course, you have the Black Legion, their tale of how they rose up, how they assembled in their quest for vengeance. And then, of course, you have the Night Lords, a struggling legion trying to survive, whilst also looking for a new purpose. All of it was so very well done, and I cannot wait to see more here. With that being said, though, I think I've dragged this video on long enough, so let's get on to the overall score. And if it weren't completely obvious by now, and I apologize for this video being so long, the Night Lord's Omnibus gets a solid 10 out of 10 from me. Aaron Dembski Bowden, you have once again succeeded in creating an amazing story, and I honestly want to read more of your works that you've done in Warhammer. Honestly, I'm very eager to see which Warhammer Omnibus I'm going to dive into next for this year, because as a goal that I've made for myself, I told myself that this year, when I did my first live stream, that I would finish more of the chunkier books that I've got in my collection, and funnily enough, a lot of those are Warhammer Omnibuses. Yeah, I know, you're probably going to get sick of seeing Warhammer on this channel, but I apologize. But, I will say, some of them have some really good stories, so stay tuned and you'll be in for a treat. Anyways, you guys, if you like this video, feel free to leave a like, comment your thoughts down below, or subscribe if you're interested for more. You never know, I might do another Warhammer review, a comic, manga, or even some random book you may know or may not know. But as always... Thank you guys so much for listening, and if you like this video, just let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you all for listening. This is Rambling Collector, signing off for now, and I will see you all in the next podcast, my fellow readers.